My name is Alicia Middleman. I'm the Curator of Education at the Estes Park Museum. Today is November 12, 2013, and we are in the Kimball Robleski residence, and we are going to interview Scott Kimball today. This is a joint effort between the Estes Valley Library and the Estes Park Museum for the Estes Valley Mountaineering Oral History Project. What is your full name? Ah, Scott Dale Kimball. And when and where were you born, Scott? I was born in 1949 in Boston, Massachusetts. And I was named after my mother and father went to school at ASU in Phoenix. And they met in Scottsdale, Arizona. So they named me Scott Dale. Isn't that kind of cute? The girls love that. That's how I got my middle name. Do you have siblings? I have my sister Lee, who lives in Florida, and my brother Randy, who's 15 years younger than me. He lives in Ludlow, Massachusetts. And as a child, were you pretty adventurous? Did you play outdoors very much? I was an outdoor. I kind of grew up in a kind of a semi-rural environment in a farming town in western Massachusetts, Southwick. And we had a lot of woods to play in and stuff. So it, was, it wasn't a city life. It, was a, and it wasn't rural. It was sort of in between. When did you get introduced to rock climbing? Only when I came to Estes Park in 1973. I moved here because a friend of mine who I went to high school with, George Hankin, he, this was during the Vietnam War era, he was a conscientious objector and he, his duty was to work at the Y camp of the Rockies for two years as a janitor. And he came out here and he really liked it. And, he, and I, uh, he was my high school buddy. He kind of, he got me out here. He said, come on out here. We've got skiing and climbing and girls in the summer and all that kind of stuff. So it was kind of fun. So I came here in 1973. And uh, I think I might have started climbing the very first day I got here because we moved to the ranch, what we call there, we'll call it Rockside, where Nathan now lives. And there were, it was a house, it was kind of a, it was a, we'll call it kind of a primitive cabin. We, none of the rooms had heat but the central room. There were four bedrooms and four guys lived there. The rent was $50 a month and split between three, four guys, $12.50 a month. It was pretty easy to live there. And uh, there was a, a clutter garden on the outside, just out the, the back, it's just the back side of, uh, I guess it's Castle Mountain. It's just rocks everywhere. And the very first day I got into town, my friends were climbers and they took me out and I had hiking, you know, like hiking boots and a Boy Scout shirt and that kind of thing. And we did some top ropes on some 5-3 thing and I kind of liked it. Who are your roommates? Uh, I don't know. Let's see. Uh, Steve Phipps, uh, Freddie Syfax, George Hankin, the gentleman that uh, got me out there, and uh, Casey Swanson who worked for the Park Service. And they sort of rotated as year, years went on, but I lived there from 73 to 81. Fifty dollars a month until the old man, Hicks, who was the banker in town, he was elderly at the time, he, we just went down and paid him the money and he, he was kind of, we'll call it Alzheimer's or dementia. I mean, he didn't realize that 50 bucks a month, he thought that was a lot of money. Are we talking about Charles Hicks or George Hicks? Or uh, Charles Hicks, not the, this is the father of the current Hicks, and they're in their 80s and 90s now, so apparently he was the one that, uh, he was the first banker in town. Other than a good deal on rent, what was the attraction to living at the ranch? Oh, I don't know, it was pretty, I try to think. We only had this one, uh, there was a kerosene burner in the front room that was the only heat we had. And we all had to sleep in our sleeping bags in our little rooms. But uh, the guys were all, most of them worked in the restaurant industry, used to have big parties there and stuff. But I kind of like the, the bouldering out back. But that's how I learned to climb, just go out and kind of scramble around on the rocks and then get a little more adventurous and do a little harder stuff. And then, you know, hone your skills on those little rocks so you could climb on the bigger ones. And to be clear, the ranch is off of Wonder View Avenue. That's right. It's uh, called. It's right. It's right west of the Stanley Mansion. 
the next house west of the Stanley Mansion, still owned by the Hicks family. And they own half that mountain behind it too. And immediately behind the house, there is an enormous rock garden. You mentioned bouldering there. There's mm -hmm. opportunities for practicing your footwork sure. on some of the more slabby rocks. And there's also some cracks to practice on. Oh yeah, I mean, you had, uh, you had, I would say, acres and acres of anything you wanted, all kind of lumpy ridge rough granite, cracks and slabs, and you get lost back there. I call it the clutter garden of rocks, and it's probably about 50 acres worth. And if you walked directly north to the hilltop, you could look over on Lumpy Ridge, and that was McGregor Ranch abutted the property. At the time, McGregor Ranch in the 70s was still a working ranch, kind of wasn't this, I guess it wasn't this conservatory that it is now. At that time, was bouldering a popular discipline of rock climbing? Uh, yeah, kind of. People bouldered to learn their skills. And you could always jump off. It was, but it wasn't popular like it is now. I mean, nobody had pads and uh, you know, bouldering magazines and websites to find all the boulders. Uh, so it wasn't popular really, but it was just kind of a fun thing to do on a half a day, or if you didn't have anybody to climb with, you could go out and play around. It was a, a working cattle ranch at the time, and that was the access to Lumpy Ridge. You had to go through the gate and close the gate because the cattle would get out, and Muriel, Muriel uh, McGregor was some sort of eccentric. I don't even know if I ever met her, but we did meet the foreman, and he kind of, he didn't like climbers too much, I don't think, at the time. But for one reason, he had to have, we had access through there because the park owned all that land on Lumpy Ridge. And there was a ranger cabin up there. Still is, I guess. I want to go back to that year, 1973, mm -hmm. when you first came to Estes Park. You had a friend working here, and you were immediately launched into rock climbing. Do you remember where your first climb was? We climbed uh, the, the rocks behind the Rockside Cabin. And then uh, uh, Steve Phipps was our, sort of our leader at the time. Uh, he, was, he had been able to climb 5'8", maybe 5'9". He had done Wolf's Tooth. That was a big thing. Wolf's Tooth on Twin Owls was like a um, kind of a, a graduation climb into hard climbing. The two pitches, it was hard crack climb. I guess it's rated 5'8 now. And then uh, one of my first climbs, we did that, and then maybe we went to, down to El Dorado, and that was another mecca of climbing. And El Dorado and Lumpy Ridge is basically where I did a lot of my climbing. Describe Lumpy Ridge to me. Ah, Lumpy Ridge. Well, you know, the, the Tate Ayatha, the, the, uh, the title of our first guidebook that Chip Salon and I co-authored, um, and that was the Arapaho name for uh, Lumpy Ridge. Uh, apparently in 1914, uh, they, 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 they went up to the Wind River Ranch in Wyoming and grabbed some old-time Arapahoes, and they came around and they named things around town historically, and they pointed out to Lumpy Ridge and said, well, that's Tate Ayatha, that's what we used to call it. And nobody, what was that? And that's Ridge of Big Lumps, I guess. So, and Chip decided that was our title for the first guidebook I wrote with him. You're referencing the Toll Expedition when they spoke to the Arapahoes to gather names. That's right. Now, what was it called? The Toll. The Toll. That's right. Yeah. T -O -L -L. And I guess they named they named uh, several things, but Lumpy Ridge was one of their names. Tate Ayatha was their translation. How did you find out about that history of, of the Arapahoes and, and their, their native names for, for the area? Well, I think that was common knowledge. The, 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 uh, there was a, a book at the time, uh, the names of Rocky Mountain National Park, and I think Chip had researched that, Chip Salon, my co-author of that guidebook. He had researched that from the library. Like I say, he was sort of an interesting guy, an environmentalist. Uh, uh, 
literary, he's a very literary guy, and a botanist. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. As I understand it, rock climbing in the region was mainly in the big mountains, the high peaks, and Lumpy Ridge was somewhat considered as a training ground for these, for these mountains. Would you agree? Well, I think you're right. I think that initially mountaineering was climbing mountains and little rocks or even big rocks was not considered mountaineering. It wasn't alpinism. But by the time I started climbing in the 70s, uh, El Dorado and Lumpy Ridge and other areas, the South Platte, those were very popular with climbers. And where did you set out to begin with climbing at Lumpy Ridge? I think Twin Owls was our first, first uh, rock that we aspired to. It was sort of like our El Cap. The Twin Owls is such a magnificent looking rock and sculptured just like owls and, it, and it's steep. And it had a, a summit that you really couldn't obtain without rock climbing experience. So that sort of had a mountaineering aspect, but, but uh, Twin Owls was one of our favorites. There are several routes on the Twin Owls today. Which ones did you do in the early 70s? Uh, I did a few first ascents there too. I climbed with, uh, uh, when I came to town, let's see, uh, we used to uh, hang around at Camito Shop that's now down where this Colorado Mountain School uh, office is. And, uh, and uh, I was a kind of a newbie guy, and I'd buy my shoes down at Camito's, and he had the, the, a lot of the outdoor stuff down there. And uh, the guide service was there, Fantasy Ridge, and that was run by Michael Covington. And uh, as he sort of took me under his wing a little bit, and we'd go out and do routes. And he was the first ascent kind of guy. He liked to do new routes. So I did a few routes on Twin Owls with Michael. He showed me the line, and I got to lead him. What kind of gear were you using at that point? Oh, the gear? Yeah, I have that uh, clunkers here that I want to show you. Can I bring those out? We'll have to do it as a separate show. Oh, okay, what kind of gear? We just, I used to buy our gear from either Outdoor World or REI. I guess REI is still in business, but uh, just uh, hexcentrics and wired nuts. Okay, when you were introduced to rock climbing, were you using hexes? and nuts and sticky rubber shoes? Now, I, I started climbing right at the era of the end of the Piton era and the start of the clean climbing ethics, the, uh, the nuts and the wire stoppers. We didn't have sticky shoes at that point. The sticky shoes came in in 1980, apparently. The, the rubber formula that they put on shoes, Firays was the first sticky shoe and everybody had those. Eventually, that was kind of a technological advancement. What kind of footwear were you using in the 70s? Let's see, the first shoe I bought down at Camito's was this, it was a Galibier shoe, it was a French shoe, okay? It was French, and it was a stiff boot, and it was black, it was Cal Cares, it was, my first pair of shoes, Cal Cares they were called, made by Galibier. And they were stiff, that you, you couldn't bend them, they were like ice climbing boots now. So if you stood on a little toe, you could, you had to have pretty strong footwork, but but we soon gave them up for EBs. That was another Glibier boot that was flexible. I have a pair we could show you later. I've got an old EB, but they didn't have sticky rubber. They just had this hard rubber on it. But I think the sticky rubber is oversold. I think it was all it's the guy wearing the shoes. It's not the, the shoes themselves. Beyond the Twin Owls, what did you set out to do next? Well, you know, the Lumpy Ridge has, oh, I'd say a dozen major rocks, and um, we used to tick them off. We'd go out to the book, or the book end, or the book mark, the pear. Uh, Sundance is the biggest rock out there. So we probably hit them all. What was your process when you go up to a crag? Do you look for the most obvious lines first, or do you have a another process? Well, we had a guidebook at the time. It was uh, Walter Fricke. He was a, 
I guess uh, in the 70s, he came out with a guidebook. I should bring it out. But so his guidebook was pretty, it was Rocky Mountain National Park. It had Lumpy Ridge in it, and it had most of the major rocks. And you'd start off by climbing classics, like if you went to the book, you'd do Fat City or Osiris. These were known climbs already that Fricky or Core, the guys from the 60s put up. Hornbine put up a few too. Uh, and after a while, you'd look around and you'd see that, wow, there's 500 other climbs here that nobody's in, no guidebook has. And we just started running up and down them. Uh, I kind of like a collector myself. I collect, as a kid, I collected baseball cards and, uh, um, and now I collect rocks and I collect stamps, I collect coins, and I just started collecting climbs too, doing climbs. What was your first priority? Collecting first ascents or writing a guidebook? Well, you know, I had to learn how to climb first, and so you had to tag along with... Uh, you found a leader, somebody that had, number one, had a rope and had gear, and you found those guys first. And the house I lived in at Rockside or the ranch had several guys that were leaders, and you tag along with them. And I used to, we'd do a climb, and um, I would, the leader would lead it, and I would follow and take out the gear, and maybe we'd do the climb again, say so like organ pipes on, the, on uh, Twin Owls. And, I would follow the climb several times and see how the leader put the chalks and the nuts in for protection, saw how they made anchors, and, uh, and I knew that I could, if I'd follow that climb a few times, I knew that I wasn't going to fall. I knew that I could do the climb, and then that's how I started being a leader myself, uh, just by being a follower for a while. Who were some of your mentors? Well, the guys that I lived at the house with, uh, Steve and George, Steve Phipps and George Hankin, and those were the guys that had the ropes and the gear, and I kind of followed them around for a year. What was their style like? Well, they were pretty conservative, and now, considering nowadays, they, they would you know, do the classic climbs and try to do them clean, not, not hanging on gear or aid. They try to do it free. In addition to following them up routes, how else did you gain knowledge about rock climbing? Now the bouldering was the big thing too. You could just go out on your time off or your, or, or uh, afternoon and just get the you know the the physicalness of climbing, the uh, the physics of climbing, how 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 many holds you could stand on and how hard you could pull and you know how high you could get without falling. You know, you, you learn by, uh, by doing, actually. And they say you have to, you, your body gets this kinetic feel to it that after a while it knows what to do. It knows how to climb up without falling. So you have to develop that. Were you pretty dedicated to training in that? You know, not like this day and age where I went and did 50 pull-ups and 50 push-ups and went down to the gym, but uh, we did a lot of climbing. And this, this era in the 70s, I, uh, it was uh, a kind of, there was, there was a bad recession going on in the late 70s. This was the post-Vietnam era and the Watergate era. There was not a lot of work around, and so we could do a lot of climbing. And if we lived at Rockside, we could just walk to Lumpy Ridge. Didn't even have to own a car, and that first few years in town, I couldn't afford a car. And you know, could barely you could get a job in the summer, maybe washing dishes or waiting tables, or this was even before the condo boom. So you could I could remember in the middle of winter there'd be one car parked downtown at the wheel, and that was it. You know, there was not a lot of things going on, and there wasn't a lot of work, so you could do a lot of climbing. <laughs> what did you do to sustain a life up here? Let me see. The first. First job I had in Estes Park was uh, a dishwasher at the coffee bar, which is one of these little places downtown. It's, I, I don't know what it's on the corner of Virginia and uh, okay. yeah, I don't know what it's. It's a knickknack shop now. But so the first job I had was washing dishes at the coffee bar. <laughs> and then you know, summertime you could get a job. Uh, uh, what other jobs I had? I, I, you know what? I, a, the second year in town, I had a job as the gardener at the Stanley. 
Uh, I got a job actually from Frank Normally, who owned the Stanley. I was the gardener and the tour guide. And he gave me a car, and I would drive guests around the loop in the park and point out the peaks. This is Ypsilon, this is Long's Peak. And, uh, and then I'd you know, plant petunias and stuff like that. It was kind of a nice job. Did you get into the park to climb uh, in addition to Lumpy Ridge? Oh, yeah, yeah. We, uh, the, the park, once again, Fricky's book had all the... You know, we had all the big climbs. You had the Long's Peak and the Petit Grapon and the Hallets. And that took a little more dedication and training to get up there. I mean, it took me a few years before you have graduated from a one-pitch climb on Twin Owls to a, an eight-pitch climb in the mountains on Hallets or something. So it took a while to get build yourself up to the bigger stuff. You mentioned one of the guidebooks you had written. What inspired you and Chip? to set out to write a guidebook? Uh, well, Chip was a literary guy, and I was a we were both climbers, and we, uh, the, guide, the former guidebook was out of print, the uh, Fricky's Fables, we used to call it, Walter Fricky's book. And it had been out of print for about 10 years, and there were hundreds of new climbs that were there already. And since we were locals, and he had the literary band, he was a photographer too, and I did a lot of the research. And uh, we decided that let's do a new guidebook. At the time, there wasn't a lot of guidebooks out there. This was our first guidebook, the Tate Ayatha, that I co-authored with Chip. I think it came out in 79, 1979. And uh, the old guidebook had been out of print for 10 years. There was a lot of new climbs. And, uh, and I was just inspired to do it. Yeah, it was kind of fun to do it. How did you gather the information about first ascents, and pinpointing the exact locations of each route? Well, you, you started with the old guidebook and those routes, and you added them to your collection, and then you'd go, any climbs you did, you'd, I used to take notes, and uh, Chip would take photographs, and we'd uh, ask some of the other locals around, Comedo's shop, for instance, at the guide shop at Fantasy Ridge, and they were big first ascenters too. And basically, the locals would gather information, and then we self-published this guidebook too in Fort Collins, at a, um, and we sold it too. But so it was, it, it was basically a natural progression for me to to start climbing here, and then doing a lot of climbing, and then realizing that wow, there's we could do a guidebook here because the, 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 there's no guidebook anymore. It's a very popular area. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's a, it's, an, it's a great area for rock climbing. It's one of the meccas, and let's do a guidebook. Who else could do it but the guys that do all the climbing? And that's, so that's what, what, what we thought. How did you come to a consensus on the difficulty of a rep? Well, you started from the old grades. You know, if, if the wolf's tooth was called 5A and the tiger's tooth was called 5'9 and the crack of fear was called 5'10, that's what your gauge was. And, you, and it was a consensus, like, you know, you'd ask some of the guys what they thought or how hard it was and what you thought compared to the 5.8, the 5.9, and the 5.10. So it was a comparative thing. Did that consume much of the conversation at the ranch? Not really. I mean, people, people did, people really wanted to climb. They didn't really care about how hard it was. But there was a, a accelerated amount of difficulty, and you're right. So once we got into the 511 range, it was a little more debating of what was hard and what was 511, what was 510, you're right. What enabled climbers to push the limits of the, the difficulty level? I think, I think they were just, uh, well, they were inspired by I think the culture of climbing was really taking off in the 70s. Climbing was big in, the, in England, and we used to have, I used to have a whole collection of mountain magazines. That was like the first climbing magazine. It was a British magazine, and they had a section on rock climbing. They had a lot of alpinism, too, but they had a section on rock climbing. And by the 70s, we had Climbing Magazine was, uh, an American magazine was published in, in Aspen, and uh, I think the rock, the free climbing, it was called. Not aid climbing, but free climbing. It was really taking off then. El Dorado was a mecca. People were, from all over the world would come to El Dorado. 
and the diamond was a big mecca too. So, so it was taken off. You have at least 144 first ascents, majority of those being free climbs. I think they all are free climbs, yeah. They all are. Why was that an important ethic of yours? Well, I think when we started climbing here in the 70s, uh, I would go out to Lumpy Ridge with my Fricky's guidebook and, and I'd see, for instance, Batman Rock and Checkerboard Rock and a lot of these other smaller rocks weren't even in the guidebook. They didn't even have a name. And so we just started climbing on them and said, well, geez, look at this beautiful rock. Nobody's ever climbed here. It might only be 200 feet high, but it's got five or six very nice lines and, and we just started climbing them. What did it feel like to be one of the very first people ever up there? I guess I was lucky to be, be here at the right time to do the, do the right climbs. Plus, so, you know, it was kind of exciting to do it too. And we were, by the time I had been climbing for three or four years, I was pretty fit. And I was in my 30s and it was, it's all I could think about was climbing. Climbing was big. How did you communicate your passion for climbing to people who didn't rock climb? Well, we didn't even care about the people who didn't rock climb. You know, it's all about climbing. <laughs> but it was, it was taking off. Boulder was a center of climbing. Uh, and there were guidebooks to high over Boulder and Erickson had his uh, Rocky Heights guidebook. And, and uh, so climbing was a world unto itself at that time. Can you walk me through the subsequent guidebooks that you authored? Sure. Uh, like uh, my first guidebook I wrote, co-authored with Chip Salon. That was uh, Tate Ayatha. We came out in 1979. We self-published that. It took us about a year to, a year to, to do the, the research. Chip did all the photography. Uh, and he had a, a dark room down on Cleve Street. He lived on Cleve Street. He had a little dark room. And, uh, and I did a lot of the actual climbing and research. And we put it together. And we got it self-published. We had 4,000. We had the first edition was 4,000 books. And that sold out in about two years. And then uh, that book came out in 79. Uh, and... Uh, at that time, the climbing really took off around here, and uh, four years later, I decided that I'm going to upgrade the guidebook, Tafe Ayatha, for a new guidebook. And at the time, Chip had gone on to other things, and uh, I, I teamed up with Anna Gret, my wife. She did the illustrations, and I started doing the photography, and I had a black room also where Chip does down on Cleve Street, and I did all the black and whites. and. It was quite a nice project. My Anna Gret helped me a lot, and I had several other gentlemen help choreograph some of the climbs and stuff. And uh, so the second guidebook I came out with, I did it through Chalkstone Press, which was uh, down in Denver, and uh, I th that came that was published in 1985, I believe, and uh, Chalkstone Press paid me several thousand dollars in advance to do the book, and that was big money back then. I could uh, spend almost all summer climbing <laughs> with my little royalty money. Uh, let me think. Uh, so that was 5,000. We had about five or 6,000 in uh, the first edition. And I never did do a second edition on that. Tell me about solitary summits. Well, this was a, like a little, uh, a little guidebook I did that was about the, the rocks up on Twin Sisters called the Crags. Now, our first guidebook that Chip and I did, Tafe Ayatha, did not include the crags for whatever reason. I don't know why. It wasn't very popular. There was some issues with access at the time. The Park Service did not own that area at the time. Lily Lake was a private area, and there was some... Texans that owned the property and they didn't like climbing. So nevertheless, we never, the crags weren't very popular because you couldn't go there. You'd have to trespass to get there, even though it's pretty majestic looking rocks. So 
I decided, because I love the crags, used to always go up there, that I said, well, we're going to do a little guidebook to the crags. So I was on this guidebook kick now. I said, well, I was sort of, this was sort of, I guess I was a prototype professional climber at the time. I did guidebooks. I worked as a guide for, for Fantasy Ridge, and then the first year at Colorado Mountain School, I was a guide. Wrote articles for climbing magazines. I was kind of a prototype professional climber. You know, I was making my living, albeit very small living, as a climber. And so guidebooks were another way to make a little income. And the fourth publication called The Long's Peak Free Climber. Tell me about that. Well, that was something I did with uh, a gentleman, Gary Sapp, who was a, public, he was a printer down in Fort Collins. And we decided that uh, I was going to do an article about the diamond. Now that came out in 1984, and the diamond at the time, in the in the early 70s, and the diamond was like an aid climbing area. People never free climbed on the diamond; it was just aid climbing. But after uh, Duncan Ferguson and Chris Reedley did the first a free ascent on the diamond, and I think maybe Goss and Logan. Too. They did several free ascents, and it kind of opened the door up to climbing on the diamond, free climbing. And uh, maybe in the course of the four or five years, I did eight or nine routes up on the diamond. No first ascents, but I did a lot of climbing on the diamond, and so did a lot of the locals, and it became a world-class area, one of the best, actually the, the world-class alpine wall in America was the diamond. And so the, the thought that, wow, I could do a guidebook, a free climbing on the diamond. Why not? I, you know, I got, I got to pump out these guidebooks to make some money. And so we decided that we were going to do this. And I kind of liked the idea that it was on the waterproof paper and it was a fold thing and kind of innovative. I didn't sell that many of them, though. In the back of your book, you list gear and repair shops like Camito Boots and guiding services like CMS. Mm -hmm. You also listed health food stores. And can you tell me about when climbers started to take a holistic approach to diet and training with their climbing? <laughs> uh, I know that in my early days, I was so poor that all I'd eat was uh, peanut butter and celery. Uh, I don't know how holistic climbers were at the time. There was still a lot of alcohol and uh, marijuana involved with climbing, even back then. <laughs> so uh, we weren't into the gym thing, but we, like I say, we, um, I think I ate, I was sort of a vegetarian, not so much because I, I, I really couldn't afford meat at the time. So peanut butter was our staple. I guess that's considered health food now. <laughs> At the time that you wrote your books, what was the climbing culture like? You know, I think the climbing culture back then was even more involved than it is now. There, I mean, there, obviously there are more climbers in town in, in, in Boulder, in this part of Colorado, but I think climbing was more uh, kind of a, a secret society maybe, or maybe an elitist sport. It was kind of, climbing was considered uh, by the general public is kind of nuts. You know, oh, what are these guys doing up there on that cliff, you know? But uh, we used to think of it as like the ultimate survival sport, climbing and ice climbing and alpinism, because you had to take everything in on your back and you, you didn't have cell phones and you, you, know, you, didn't, you had to do your own rescue if there was problems. So it was, I think it was, it was more exciting back than it is now. Now it's so commercialized, I believe. I have an article you wrote from Mountain Adventure magazine in 1983. It describes a winter ascent of Pagoda's West Ridge Falls. And in it you describe a fresh blanket of snow slows the drive to Glacier Gorge parking lot. The trailhead is obliterated by yesterday's storm. We start skiing right from the car. Usually skiing is fun, but this, breaking trails for seven miles, tackling steep alpine slopes and carrying 40 pounds. Loads somehow lacks the grace and effortless motion. It is just plain hard work. Hmm. I think we probably built a snow cave below Pagoda and uh, 
it's hauled in the, have you ever lived in a snow cave? Or, you know, it's kind of neat. Uh, it never gets colder than 30 degrees, but never gets warm either. So we, I think we took that big pax in there and we made a snow cave below Pagoda and did the a climb the next day and skied out. Um, after a while, I, I really enjoy climbing in the mountains more than on Lumpy Ridge and stuff. But the season's short. The season was short and uh, did a lot of routes on Hallets and the, uh, the Cathedral Spires and did a bunch of climbs. The Diamond was the big thing. The Diamond was our peak. Our, our mecca, the diamond. That's where I did my little guidebook on the diamond. I did probably seven or eight routes, free routes on the diamond. I was pretty lucky to get up them all. Why was the diamond your mecca? Well, I mean, it's, if you look at, they say that the, the Long's Peak is sort of a vortex of energy. I mean, it is a very majestic looking peak and that diamond shaped wall up there it sort of had a draw for us and you can see it from most anywhere in town and i really think there's a lot of a lot of energy up there some sort of vortex up there do you get wanted to tap into that i guess <laughs> have you lived in estes park consistently since no i haven't you know i i came here in 1973 uh and then uh in 1984 i i married anna gret and we had a child yuri and we moved back east because uh at the time uh, climbing wasn't i couldn't make a living climbing anymore it's kind of like a bachelor thing like a ski guide or a climbing guide i mean you really couldn't make a living as a father and a family i moved back east and lived in the town that i grew up in western massachusetts southwick with my wife and I went to school and I, I, I upgraded and retooled as a registered nurse. But we came back in 1997 and I've been still climbing ever since. That's when we really got into climbing at the crags, 1997. So I haven't been here continually. Tell me about the crags. Well, you know, uh, I moved into this house and my next door neighbor was Tim Hansen, and he was a, a very good climber, and he was sort of a sport climber. Now, the difference between sport climbing is more climbing bolted routes, equipping routes with bolts and, and, uh, and an anchor, and climbing uh, with, a, with bolts as your protection. And, uh, and sport climbing was starting to take off then in the, in the late 80s. And, uh, Tim and I, uh, and it was Tim's sort of idea, was, let's go up the crags and start climb. let's start putting up routes at the crags, bolted routes. And it was a perfect spot to go because there's hardly any natural lines at the crags and a lot of steep vertical faces. Uh, the rock is uh, nice. So it's horizontally banded, but the, there's not a lot of vertical cracks. And it's perfect for making sport climbs. So I think Tim and I and my son, Yuri, and, and a few other gentlemen, uh, Doug, Doug Snidely for one, we put up about 50 or 60 sport climbs up there in the last, in, in about a five year period. And now I guess it's taken off and people have really gone up there now. The secrecies of beta, a 514 up there that's like, brings, brings hundreds of people a week up there in the summer. How did the climbing community in Estes Park respond to bolting? Well, you know, uh, now, I, now, once again, I was gone from 84 to 97, and that's when the bolting controversies and wars uh, evolved. So I kind of missed out on that. By the time I got back to Estes Park in 1997, uh, uh, it was pretty much considered sport climbing was okay. And people were in, and they had run out of natural, natural crack climbs to do, and and that was sort of a natural progression of sport climbing and bolted climbs. So I missed out on all the controversy in that. I guess there was some chopping of bolts and you know, bolt wars, more so in Boulder. How did it change over the years using guidebooks for information as opposed to electronic forums like the Mountain Project today? Well, I guess uh, the Mountain Project, that's right. Um, 
that's kind of sanitized now, the Mountain Project thing. It used to, when it first came online, and I don't know when it was, people could anonymously make comments. It was quite the uh, social network. Now it's pretty sanitized. Uh, you can't say anything. You can't say boo or anything. It's, I think, and guidebooks are sort of passe now, aren't they almost? Now guidebooks have turned to coffee table books with color photos and, uh, and a lot of the information is on the internet, you're right. Do you participate in forums? You know, I used to. Uh, I used to. Do, I've, I've, I've grown out of it for some reason. I think that a lot of the, like the Mountain Project stuff, for instance, is uh, not advancing the sport at all. It's kind of trashing areas by, by over-publicizing them, I should think. What used to advance the sport? Say that again now? What used to advance the sport? Oh, uh, oh. well, I think uh, the big, big gear companies and the rope companies. Are, and now there's a whole crop of professional climbers and competitions and gyms. I think gyms are the big thing. In the last 15 years, the gym climbing has advanced the sport where people learn at a young age to climb on the plastic and the gyms, and that has brought a lot of people into the sport. You mentioned that you guided for a little while. Yeah, Who did was, you uh, guide for? The first year that Colorado Mountain School was in existence, uh, in the 70s, the guide service was uh, Fantasy Ridge, Michael Covington's business, and he sold it to uh, he sold it in 1983 to uh, Michael Donahue, and I was one of the first guides that worked for Michael Donahue. And we'd uh, we, he had the concession to the park on Lumpy Ridge. Most of the stuff I did was just take people out to Rock One, a little rock next to Twin Owls, and take them out for half a day and make fifty three dollars. <laughs> Fifty-three dollars. That's what the half-day uh, fee was for the guide. And you were lucky to get a tip. Maybe somebody would take you down to the Surrey and they buy you a, a, a hamburger. Any memorable moments as a guide? No, I, I wasn't. I, I got to the point where I didn't care for guiding that much. Basically, you're taking strangers out to climb, and that and it got to be work. You know, when climbing was work, it kind of lost its allure to me, and I, I didn't care for it that much. Over the years, how did you find your climbing partners? Well, let's, I had quite a... I, I guess we kind of gravitate to each other. My first climbing partner after living at Rockside with the, the guys up there, and I uh, met uh, Michael Neary. He was another gun-ho kid from, uh, from Rhode Island, and... And uh, he was my first climbing partner. And then he unfortunately died on Long's Peak on a, on a winter accident. And uh, uh, that was sad. But climbing partners just came. There was a lot of, there was always climbers that came to Estes Park, mostly, mostly in the summer. I climbed with quite a few people. And it, the partners were, uh, it, it was uh, something you almost had to have if you wanted to climb hard. You had to have a partner with you. Uh, you had to have a partner that was also dedicated to climbing. I climbed with uh, uh, a gentleman for several years, did a lot of first ascents, Carl Harrison. He lived in town here. Uh, he was a British gentleman. His father climbed with Joe Brown, a famous British climber, and he was, had a tradition to climb. And I climbed with Carl for quite a few years. He went on to uh, live in the Himalayas. He still does. He, he has a Himalayan guide service there, and I climbed with a, a gentleman, Bill Wiley, who uh, is a photography uh, professor at the University of Virginia. It, it was always it, pretty easy to find climbing partners. Pretty easy to find climbing partners. You could just kind of go down to the uh, Colorado Mountain School and hang out there, and there'd be a lot of climbing partners. You could almost pick and choose who you wanted to climb with. And you always pick friends that you liked. They, that, they became good friends. Did you have any close calls? 
Uh, you know, I was lucky in a way, and I always tell people that, that uh, one of my saving graces, I never injured myself. I never got injured. And I, once I sprained my ankle or something, but other people have, of course, been unlucky with climbing. So I say that uh, the biggest thing that keeps you going is to keep injury free. Keep injury. Of course, we had close calls, you know, lightning strikes and... I never really had any big falls where I hurt myself or anything, so I got very lucky in that respect. I want to talk to you about motivation. Motivation. You have been involved in a tremendous amount of root development, as we mentioned before, at least 145 roots. How did you go about finding a new crag and um, what, if anything, do you think they have in common with each other? Well, I think we were motivated. Uh, I was always motivated by doing new climbs. Once my skill level got to the point where I could climb 511, uh, there was a lot of climbs I could do. And, uh, and I felt almost that we were, you know, at the peak of our performance, the tip of the spear. We, we, we thought that... And that kind of motivated me to be in the forefront, for even just for a short little time. And I wasn't the greatest climber by any means. And I had a lot of friends that were you know, legendary climbers, uh, Jimmy Dunn or Billy West Bay. Uh, they were legendary almost. And, and I was hanging out with those guys. So I felt that, that, that aura, that awe. And then, just for a short time, though, it goes away. And then you get to be old father family man. But Take here you easy. are continuing well, to... A little bit. I still enjoy it. My son, see that helped me too. My son grew up, uh, he, of course he initially when he was a junior high in that era, he didn't want to do what his parents like. We like climbing. So he didn't want to do that. But eventually when he came to Estes Park and he did his four years of high school here and he graduated in 2011. Excuse me. Uh, 2001, he, he joined the gym team and he got into the gym thing and he and then uh, I did a lot of climbing with my son too, which was uh, a lot of fun because I could get out of the house you know I didn't have to explain to my wife where I was going I'm taking the kid out climbing, it was perfect so we did a lot of climbing, at the crags we go to Shelf Road he was more of a sport climber and he turned into a boulder but so it was fun to have my son as a climbing partner for a while. Good excuse to get out every every weekend. <laughs> In addition to having somebody to belay you, what does it mean to see your son Yuri climb? He was good. He's he was much better than me. I wish he'd take it up more, but he realized quick that climbing is like a little just a little shot in the dark and then it's not really real life anymore. And you can't really climb hard for very long. So he So I guess he's He's gone on to other things. Do you have predictions for what the climbing scene will be like in the future? Well, I don't know what the climbing is. It seems like they're just getting harder and harder climbs. Uh, it's just fun to read about it in the climbing magazines, I guess, all the hard climbs. Because we have a whole crop of professional climbers now. That's all they do is climb. And they're sponsored to climb. So they're going to take the, the, the difficulties to higher heights, I'm sure. You mentioned leaving Estes Park for a, a brief period of time and then coming back. What is so captivating about climbing in the Estes Valley and Rocky Mountain National Park? Well, I, I, when I left uh, Estes, I got married and I, got a, I had to retool and get a, a, a new profession. Uh, I always wanted to come to Estes, back to Estes. I, it's sort of, sort of my, uh, you know, I, basically Estes was where I discovered myself and what I liked to do and I, I didn't want to be away from it that long. I didn't want to live in an eastern city or anything like that. And today, what is your community of, of climbing partners like? Well, I climb with uh, 
and I climb a little bit with my son still on Father's Day. He, I get, he gets to get me out on Father's Day maybe, but and then I climb with some of the older guys like uh, Douglas Snively, uh, and then there's a few young guys I climb with a little bit, but the, the climbing community is a little more, it's not as, well, I'm an older gentleman now, of course. Uh, the climbing community is, seems not as uh, holistic as it used to be back in the old days. And so, uh, and I guess we could go down to the gym and hang out. I'm sure I'd meet a lot of new climbers down at the local gym. Do you have any memories of climbing in a gym? <laughs> uh, when I, let's see, the, the Trail Ridge Outfitters had a gym. It was before uh, the mountain shop down by the dam had a gym. Uh, there was, uh, I don't know, gym climbing is a lot of fun. It's a good thing to keep you fit in the winter. That's all I can think of. I'm just thinking it must have been a big contrast to having been introduced to climbing at Lumpy Ridge and Castle Mountain right off the bat. Well, it's an evolution. This gyms bring a lot of people into climbing, and it's a good way to meet people. I guess the town like Boulder has four or five gyms now. By the way, I get free passes down there now. I guess CMS owns one of the gyms down there, Boulder Rock Club. And uh, I told one of the uh, girls I work with, who's, whose husband is the gym manager, that I was, one the, I was a guide the first year CMS was in operation. So I got a few free passes to the gym. I haven't been down there yet, though. Pioneering has its perks. <laughs> I guess, yeah. Are there any last stories you'd like to share? No, let me think. Let me think. Stories. Uh, I guess I've been lucky that uh, uh, I've had these uh, good people to climb with, adventurous people to climb with, uh, and people that were safe, and uh, we got through it alive. <laughs> That's all I can think of at the time. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you.